Well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism podcast. Uh, this is actually the first episode of 2023. It's episode 31. Uh, just in terms of announcements, of course, like I moved to the States a few weeks ago, and I will be here for a few years, so huzzah to dash. Um, myself and Peter Dumit, the Catholic apologist, um, are looking for a venue for the debate on the Immaculate Conception. Hopefully that will be sometime in February, so I'll make the announcement um, about that. Um, and hopefully it will be live streamed. It will, of course, be recorded and so forth. So, um, you know, uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, no other announcements, except like um, hopefully sometime in February, I will have Turk Lacour on to discuss macro evolution. Natalian Givens will be coming on to discuss abortion again. And hopefully uh, we'll have him and maybe even his father, Terrell, to discuss their most recent book from Erdman's. Um, also, hopefully sometime in February, I'll have Jacob Vedrine on to discuss Joseph Smith's polygamy and Matthew Bowen to come on as well. Uh, maybe something to do with his work on, on the Masticon in the Book of Mormon. So um, be sure to look out for those episodes. Uh, today's guest is actually a very good friend of mine, uh, originally from Israel, Alan Hansen. Uh, Alan, thanks for coming on today. I'm glad you have me. Thank you. I believe that would be an ecumenical matter. It would be. <laughs> uh, for those who are not yes, going to know, no. myself and uh, Alan are fans of the Irish comedy uh, Father Ted. Um, so um, One of the greatest ever. <laughs> Yes, and the best Irish comedy of all time. Even better than Dairy Girls, and Dairy Girls is hilarious. Um, so before we kind of discuss our topic, which will be on the Messiah, son of Joseph, uh, Alan, how about you just tell us uh, a few things about yourself? You know, where are you from originally? Uh, what got you interested in religious and Mormon studies in general? You know, and so forth. So originally, I was born and raised in Israel. I've been in the U.S. for about... I don't know, 13 years or so. My time flies there. But I grew up in Israel. My, my family on my mother's side, we, we go back very far in the church. On my dad's side, my grandparents joined. That's the Jewish side there. They joined. My grandfather moved to Israel in 1973, uh, a couple of months before the war. So it was always a matter of great timing. But we, so I grew up in, in the church, but also in an environment which we are one of the few LDS families in the northern part of the country for many years, a few others. So when I went to school, it was always in regular Israeli schools. There was a big, strong religious bent. I was born in one of the cities that's like a main center of Kabbalah and Hasidism nowadays. So I just, I've always been surrounded by that. And then on my mission, it just, I had a renewed interest in that side of things. And so I read more about it and look into all that. That's, that's kind of how I started to get more into that. And of course, I had a lot of perspectives and things that I remember just picking up as a child that's a little bit outside the usual way of looking at things. And um, you served your mission in uh, Russia, is in that correct? Southern Russia, yeah. Yeah. Former Stalingrad was in my first, first area. <laughs> and I'm guessing you would have had like some encounters and studies with um, dealing with Eastern Orthodoxy as well. We did quite a bit. We did. One of several investigators came from that background. We had one that was a defrocked priest. And so he shared a little bit of things. It was interesting one of the one of the converts that I worked with really closely were, came from very devout Orthodox background, so we had a lot of discussions that way. Ran also ran into plenty of Jewish history and things in that part, which is interesting. Fills my other my other interests. Usually a bit late for some of the church related things, but still just like fascinating in and of itself. Okay, and um, today's topic, well, as much as I want to discuss the energy's essence distinction in Eastern Orthodoxy and its relationship to LDS theology, uh, today's topic is, of course, the uh, Messiah and Joseph traditions. Now, um, this is actually a bit of a popular idea that's floating around like some LDS circles. Um, I think my very first encounter of this was actually by an article by the late John Tratnus, and um let me just say, Tretinus was absolutely awesome. He's one of my favorite LDS scholars. I think your uh, grandparent, one yeah. of your grandparents actually knew him personally as my well. My grandfather knew him personally. He actually, Tretinus actually helped reactivate him in Israel. 
Yeah. So uh, this is not like me dumping on Tretnas. He was brilliant. And one of my biggest yeah. regrets in life is never meeting them. But he wrote an article that was published by Meridian Magazine, now LDS Living, I think, like a couple of years ago, like 2005. Oh, well, I, yeah. Yeah. Close to 20 it, years ago. Yeah. It, it's been a while. Um, where he discussed Messiah and the Joseph traditions, and he argued um, that the parallels were rather meaningful between the Messiah and the Joseph. Um, a figure in various Jewish tra- texts and traditions, and the prophet Joseph Smith. Um, for instance, some of the parallels that he and others have listed, for instance, would say the Messiah, son of Joseph, would come in the Messianic age. There would be calamities associated with his birth. Um, some would point to the mean of uh, Joseph, meaning to add or to increase. Um, how God will send his prophet and anointed king. Your parallel in Joseph being crowned king of the world in the Council of 50 and being the ruler of Israel, uh, dying in battle and being a military general. Uh, Joseph, of course, was um, a general in the Nauvoo Legion, and of course, he was killed in Carthage jail. Um, some would point to, like, he claimed that Isaiah 11 would be fulfilled through the instrumentality of the Messiah's son of Joseph, and um, how he would be an instrument to restore true worship to Israel. And because of these and other parallels, um, the Messiah's son of, son of Joseph was actually a prophecy or a prediction of Joseph Smith or something that was fulfilled in the person of Joseph Smith and his mission. Now, I remember like first coming across this and because it was from Trenton, it's like, holy crap, this is awesome. Um, and it, I kind of got like really excited because uh, of this. But um, over the years, you know, I've actually read some books and articles on the Messiah Ben and Joseph traditions. And I know you've done a lot of work on the original languages yourself and kind of found it to be uh, sometimes a bit of a stretch. Um, and if one wants to claim it was fulfilled by Joseph Smith, you know, you have to do a lot of nuancing. So um, hopefully this podcast episode will be a bit of a corrective to like um, an overemphasis on these traditions, maybe a misunderstanding of them. You know, um, it should not be taken as like a stumping on, say, Tretnas or clean scouts, at, at least on this point. Yeah. Right. Not at all. They did each of them. Skousen, Truman Madsen, Twetness, Matthew Brown, they all they all did a lot of tremendous work in getting us to treat ancient connections to our scriptures seriously. So we're not just stuck to like trying to argue it from 19th century perspective, but we we've got grounds that we can take things seriously. So they did excellent work. Of course, anyone, any scholar who does any kind of work is going to have their blind spots and misinterpretations. Same thing, for example, I've got almost every book that Gershom Sholem ever wrote, who's the father of modern Kabbalah studies and Jewish mysticism. And he's got several of his former disciples that take a different line than him in many ways. And a lot of what he's argued has had to be adjusted in many ways, which is it's the nature of making discoveries. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. It's like, uh, this is not an attack on them. It's like, we just b- would both agree that they kind of went uh, a little beyond what the evidence would allow. So Right. And a lot of it boils down to not spending very much time in the sources. Twetness and Matthew Brown have probably done the most work in that from an LDS side. And Twetness more than Brown. But they both just relied on a small corpus of texts. Tretinus not so much. He had better access to Hebrew, but they just relied on a very small number of texts and a couple of secondary studies in many cases. And I want to take time like together with you and just go a little bit more into what the context of this is, like what it means as a Jewish tradition before we try to just treat it like kind of Frankenstein theology. Just take a, a bit from here, a bit from there, and attach it together. So it works. Now, how I kind of came to this, I mean, I remember in my early childhood, the, the Lubavitch Rebbe had, had just passed away, and his fo- some of his followers, not all of them, his followers kind of split on this point. But several of them thought that he was the Messiah and that God took him up into hiding and inclusion until it was time to bring him back and redeem the world. So we had, in the town where I grew up, there are lots of banners, people I met there proclaiming 
Messiah, him as a Messiah. So that, that's kind of how I, how I first encountered that. Of course, it wasn't until many years later. Uh, I remember, I remember hearing Truman Matson in his Joseph Smith lectures mentioning it. And then later on, when I moved to US, I started looking a little bit more in depth, actually looking at some of the sources. Okay, so uh, maybe in today's episode, we can actually discuss what these sources are and what they actually do tell us, um, you know, um, and maybe we can actually evaluate the accuracy of how traditionally they've been used by LDS and we can actually maybe propose ways it could be nuanced by uh, LDS as well. So, Absolutely. So um, what do you think are the most important sources, uh, especially the primary sources for uh, Messiah, Son of Joseph related traditions? Well, in terms of, say, the original languages, yeah. but like if you know any good English translations, because um, as nerdy as the audience is, myself included, like some may not have access to, say, Hebrew or Aramaic. But... Yeah. So one of the best collections in English of relevant texts is going to be John Reeves' Trajectories in the Eastern Apocalypse, where he takes most of the early and major Jewish sources about the Messiah, Son of Joseph, Messiah, Son of David. He has a website where he has his translations. So that we're going to have that in the link, but that's actually a really good place to start with if you want to look at the big texts from the early medieval era. Head and shoulders over all of these is the book of Zerubbabel. There's some, sorry, let, let me put it a bit differently. So the book of Zerubbabel is gonna be the major influence on all the upcoming, uh, sorry, on all the subsequent Messiah and Joseph traditions. Its impact was huge. We know that it's probably somewhere in the sixth century AD. That seems to be when it was mostly formed. Traditions, everyone, including Martha Himmelfarb, who's, who has a lot of good English studies on it, everyone seems of the opinion that the traditions are older. Traditions are older, so they do go back a bit. We don't know exactly when. But during the Byz Byzantine era, there was a huge awakening of interest in the Messiah. That's when we begin to see texts from that period. Do you want me to go on a little bit more about like what some of the things were that influenced this interest? Yeah, of course. Uh, just I just was checking Amazon. The book by Reeves on his trajectories book um, is actually now available as a paperback, uh, just under thirty dollars. So um, it's it's available. Also on the show notes, I'll include the uh, link that you sent me where some yeah. of uh, the translations of the relevant literature are. So uh, maybe if you were to like discuss, like say um, the Messiah, Son of Joseph and what we learned from these texts and also yeah. um, is there like a uh, identification of this figure with the Messiah, Son of David? Because sometimes we hear about the uh, two me messiahs, but I've heard like some claim numerically they're actually one the same person. Uh, so if you want to like discuss that and any other topics okay. you wish. Absolutely. So. The figure that we know him in the general terms, because we can start from that, dig into more details, is that there's going to be two messiahs. One is going to be the Davidic king, the one who reigns over the world and helps complete redemption. He does whatever is needed to vanquish all of Israel's enemies, bring peace and order, and basically lead the earth as God would. So that's a Messiah, son of David. Messiah, son of Joseph, is a figure that's usually the forerunner. And he tries to hasten the redemption and bring it about now. And he gathers many of Israel, brings them down to Jerusalem. And then he vanquishes a lot of the enemies, slaughters them, and usually reinstitutes temple worship until a stronger enemy comes and kills him. Messiah, son of David, usually comes back and resurrects him and then proceeds to vanquish all the enemies in complete redemption. So that's the classic image. Okay, just, just, 
yeah, just, maybe just like one or two short questions on that, if you don't mind. Um, would, of course, like in Ezekiel's prophecy, there's the prophecy of like, say, the eschatological temple. Uh, do some of these traditions think like that's associated with the temple that's restored with the Messiah ben, uh, ben Yosef, or is that the, um, or do they not make that connection? Most of the time, they're not making that connection. Okay. Most of the time, the Messiah, son of Joseph, does things without miracles. Okay. Without, or rather, without explicit miracles. Okay, and I'm sure, like uh, some LD, uh, LDS, LDS, uh, thinking like when they hear deliverance, uh, of course, would it, uh, what type of deliverance would this be? Would this be only physical deliverance, a la deliverance from enemies and their destruction? Or would it be a bit more like, um, for lack of a better term, soteriological deliverance here as well? It, it's rather both. It's rather both. Because first and foremost, the prop relationship between God and Israel and the land is that Israel is secure in its land with God as its king and implying the proper worship. And there's also really interesting debate in some of the earliest recorded Messiah and the Joseph traditions in the Babylonian Talmud and in the Yerushalmi also Palestinian Talmud, they have a vaguer parallel. But you have two of the rabbis discussing if the mourning in Zechariah is for the Messiah and the Joseph or if it's for the evil urge. And they usually, and the discussion seems to be settled in the direction of the evil urge being vanquished. And some people, they come up, some of the explanations for that get rather um, stretched rather thin. Like they're saying they're, they're weeping because they realized what a thing of straw it was and they could have easily vanquished it themselves. But there is a connection between soteriological deliverance and the actual security of dwelling in the land with the king and your God. No, that's fine because like some think like well the Jews had no idea of like soteriological deliverance and some of course will think like uh, deliverance was only purely soteriological but here it's both hands you know um yeah. you, you make sure it's physical first and then like uh you know that allows for the soteriological i.e temple worship and true worship to be um protected and reinstituted right no that's and perfect proper repentance that's the main that's the main theme, especially in the rabbinic traditions, which are a little bit different than the other Jewish traditions at the time. But they put a stronger emphasis on repentance as part of the redemption process. And when we're, you ask me, like, are they sometimes identified as one of the same, Messiah Son of Joseph, Messiah Son of David? Not quite, but there is a rabbinic tradition that holds that if Israel is worthy and repents and is ready, then they'll be delivered by the Messiah, son of David, and not have to undergo the stage of Messiah, son of Joseph, because that, that involves a lot of calamities and disasters. So, um, and maybe this is just the open test in me, but um, so would it would be fair to say from your uh, knowledge of the uh, sources that um, that was a real contingency. It wasn't like, say, uh, Messiah Ben Yosef and then Messiah Ben David, that would be like uh, very deterministic, you know, um, instead it would be, that's a possible contingency, but only Messiah Ben David, if you're nice and repentant, um, that was a real contingency as well. Yes, with the Jewish tradition, the rabbinic strand emphasized repentance. The, the more apocalyptic strand was very deterministic. And you see that in Qumran, yeah. Yeah, and you, you see that throughout, like basically throughout the centuries, but also really strong in the time of the Babylonian Talmud and things. So just the Byzantine era before the rise of Islam is, you see actual, you see traces of a debate between deterministic views of history and between more contingent repentant ones. And then Islam comes in and throws a wrench into the whole schema of the kingdoms of the kingdoms of Christianity and Persia, because they bring up a third force that hadn't been discussed earlier. Okay, um, and 
you know, even today in 2023, uh, even in LDS circles, that is the old contingency uh, determinism thing is still uh, debated. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, okay, so that's some of the aspects of the MSI Ben Yosef. What are some of the other uh, beliefs about what he would do and who he would, not necessarily like the identity of who he was, but like uh, his purpose and he, the telos basically of the MSI Ben yeah. Yosef? So his telos. And we don't really know if this is prescriptive or descriptive and what they believed as if this is things he must do, but generally we see him gathering Israel to him, redeeming Jerusalem by force, vanquishing their enemies, restoring temple worship and ruling over Israel to keep them righteous on the right path. That's his main purpose. Later on, in the later medieval Jewish mysticism, he becomes very spiritualized. And he's there to vanquish metaphysical forces of evil. I'll explain that a bit later, but he, that's his main combat is not against flesh and blood enemies anymore, like he is in the earlier sources, but he fights forces of evil and is meant to bring about the perfect restoration and repair of the world for the Messiah, son of David, to come in. And would these like forces of evil, would this be just like general, vague, good versus evil, moral versus immoral, or would we like win a more supernatural realm, like say demons and Satan? Um... They're all the same. You've got in Jewish mysticism an idea that develops of husks, like just different forces of evil that come over and just basically encrust the good and prevent it from shining through and doing what it needs to. And these, these husks of evil, they're both demonic forces, they're general wickedness, and just things that have gone wrong. And when it comes to say, the Messiah Ben Joseph, uh, Van Kershin, the Yetzer Harar, the evil inclination, the evil impulse that you mentioned previously, would that be both before and after spiritual, spiritualization of the uh, traditions? So in the earlier parts I mentioned earlier, there he doesn't do that. It's just I'm saying it's mentioned in the same discussion of what the messianic era is like, basically, is the implication. But Fair he enough. doesn't actually have a role doing that. Okay. So it's more like an effect of uh, he's coming as opposed to something he actually as an right. instrument perpetrates. No, that's no, exactly. that's no, that's interesting. Um, and of course, like um, he he's depicted as being a military leader and a general. Um, he, he says before or after his resurrection, because I've heard like from some who claim, well, um, you know, the Messiah Ben Joseph would be this military leader who would vanquish his enemies. But I remember, like, I think, I think it was you when you were interacting with Matt Brown a couple of years ago said this was only after his resurrection. So. Um, is there like an ambiguity as to the traditions about the chronology of this, or is that pretty much settled um, in terms of the uh, text? So the one I had in mind, if I recall correctly, was the Book of Zerubbabel, which implies his military leadership before his death and resurrection, but it gives the active military role to Hephzibah, the mother of the Messiah. Uh, you, you'll be interested in this because as several people have argued, including Martha Himmelfarb, this is likely just an adaptation of Byzantine Mariology, where they'd carry her banners into battle with them and many things like that. So she has an active role in there. Then she drops out the tradition almost entirely, except for a couple of medieval sources. But that's why in that particular book, the Messiah Son of Joseph doesn't do most of the military work until after his resurrection. Okay, um, that's that's interesting. Um, any other traditions or um, ideas about the uh, Messiah Ben Joseph that you think would be noteworthy uh, from the uh, various texts and traditions? I want to talk about some of the later stuff a little bit later chronologically, but and I'll say there's a really interesting tidbit about the year Joseph was born. Okay, um, we'll go into we'll go into that when we discuss like how you could possibly see him as fulfilling that role. Sure, but um, so whatever you want to discuss next, um, hey. I'll let you do that. Absolutely. No, one of the easiest places to start is the book of Zerubbabel because it's the most developed early source that we have. 
and it influences pretty much everything that comes after. Prior to that, we, we've got like multiplicity of messiahs that we know from Qumran, other places. David Mitchell has tried very hard to push idea of Messiah bin Joseph all the way back to the Bible. One of the interesting things there is that the verses that he points out in the Bible as reflecting that get very little attention outside some of the Aramaic paraphrases that typically post-date Islam, particular ones. But these ones get very little attention. They're not a focus point on anything, which makes it a little bit hard to assume that these, let me put it this way, it makes it a little bit hard to assume that you started out with the well-developed tradition and bits of it have fallen away and been corrupted. And when Mitchell says that the rabbis insisted this was biblical, on the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, there's very little that they didn't hold was biblical or at least use proof texts for, which is what we see here. They don't actually press this point very hard either. Martha Himmelfarb and others hold that you've got these traditions that existed long before Zerubbabel, and then just get shaped into what we see in that book. But before you talk about the actual traditions, I think it's really worth talking about the social context of these, what the tradition meant to the people who were living it and encountering it. Now, way back in the 1940s, there was an Israeli scholar called Yoda Kaufman or Evan Shmuel. And he put together a compilation called the Midrash of Redemption. And he came up with this concept, which has pretty much been adapted by everyone in the field, even though his editorial methods were very heavy handed and he basically rewrote a lot of the texts. But he noticed that many of these apocalypses, as we call them, they all share a common theme, which is consolation for the trials that Israel is undergoing and the hope of redemption, that God will send someone that will help vanquish the enemies and restore what needs to be restored as far as worship goes. At this time, the majority of the Jews in the world lived under one of two empires, the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire in Persia. And in the Byzantine Empire, they were often persecuted, like heavily fined, beaten, killed, per worship was prevented. Many of the restrictions that Islam put on the Christian and Jewish minorities were actually taken over from the Byzantine Empire on how they treated Jews. So we've got a lot of, we've got a community that's facing a lot of restrictions that every year remembers how the temple was destroyed. So then you have people who are the preachers, who are the poets and what the synagogue, in the synagogue poetry used, who are giving sermons, trying to encourage people not to give up, not to apostatize, not to give up hope, this is when we see these traditions really take wing. The book of Zerubbabel starts out with the return from the, the Babylonian captivity, as we read in books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And Zerubbabel is one of the princes of the people and major political leader. And in this book, it has him get visits from an angel, Yushimetatron, who's also identified with Michael and Enoch in many cases. He receives, tradition, he receives these visits from an angel and he keeps asking the angel, what's gonna to happen to the people? When is all this going to end, all the suffering? He, and he gets shown 
a Messiah who suffers, and who's there among the wounded and the sick at the gates of Rome. He's a prisoner in Rome, and he's waiting for the day when he can come in and redeem his people. The book of Zerubbabel also teaches that he's the son of Hezekiah, basically, that was born back then and then hidden away with God till it's time to come forth. So very strong mythical connotations there. This is someone who was born hundreds of years prior. That's a Messiah. And then the Messiah's mother and the staff of Aaron or Moses and the Messiah, son of Joseph, are hidden in the city of Tiberias, which is right next to where I used to live. But that's fun there. But he's, they're hidden in there until the right moment also. So the main messiahs, these are people that are prepared centuries before. And when we say prepare, not in the sense that Joseph Smith was prepared, as in God knew what time to bring him forth. But these are people who are living a naturally long lives, like say three Nephites. And then it starts with the Messiah, son of Joseph, and Hephzibah, the mother of the Messiah. They gather together Israel, everyone they can. Sometimes this includes the lost tribes. That's not always clear. But they gather together. They march up on Jerusalem. They take it over. The Messiah, son of Joseph, slaughters the enemies of Israel. He restores the temple. And then it says that he lets Israel join together. Let's, he organizes Israel according to their families. This is not really referring to genealogy in the sense that we do it. This, the Hebrew used very strongly reflects the book of Ezra, where the families come in and they are organized according to their family and lineage. The Messiah himself is named, the son of Joseph is named Nehemiah, son of Hushiel. So Nehemiah, just same as we see in the Bible, same name. And Hushiel means Lord hasten. So it's just hinting at his role there. So he does that. He brings peace. In the book of Zerubbabel, he rules for 40 years in peace. The mother of the Messiah fights off some of the enemies. But then too many of the enemies gather. In some accounts, it's the Persian king. In some accounts, it's Armillus. I'll explain who that is. But you have a very powerful enemy that comes, fights the Messiah, and slays him. I think there's a problem with your... Uh... Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what we missed. Oh, you were just mentioning the um, mother, uh, the mother of yeah. this Messiah, and then they kind of went solid. Okay, yes. So mother of the Messiah fights several of the battles. She'll have a more active role after the Messiah's death, but she, they fight some of the battles. They have peace for 40 years. Then the enemies of Israel, they get too strong. In some accounts, it's the Persians. And in some accounts, it's Armillus. I'll explain who that is, but it's an Antichrist-like figure one of the representatives of evil, they come and they slay the Messiah, and then they try to destroy the rest of Israel. The mother of the Messiah of David preserves the lives of many of them, fights them off, until about 40 days later, the Messiah of David appears with Elijah. Then they resurrect the Messiah, son of Joseph. The Messiah of David destroys his enemies with the breath of his mouth. And then happy ending, everyone's, everyone's restored to their land and peace and joy. Well, that's interesting. Um, maybe this is a bit off topic, but like just uh, when it comes to, say, the mother of the, uh, the messianic figure, and maybe just my interest in Mariology, um, did any of them ever met any association with the um, Genesis 3.15 and um, the crushing of the serpent or any other no. um, text that later traditions would associate either directly or indirectly with uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. We expect to see that, especially in a lot of the later Kabbalistic symbolism, but we don't. Okay. 
And one of the theories on that is not that they were embarrassed by her, because it used to be thought that in Christian lands, maybe they didn't want strong associations with Mary, but a couple of texts we have are actually from Christian lands, the later ones, but it's just like the Muslim, the Jews in Muslim lands just weren't that interested. It wasn't a major concern there or anything. It just kind of drops out of interest. Okay. No, I, I, just like when you were mentioned, it's like, yeah. mm, well, may, maybe because I'm the odd LDS, you actually has an interest in Mariology, uh, but no, that's that's interesting. And you were mentioned like how you would actually discuss who this Antichrist figure uh, is. Um, was he an actual person or was he more like a personification? Um, you know, as some figures of evil tend to be. Um... The answer seems to be a bit of both. Several people like Hilo Neumann, there's some other studies in the 70s have argued that we sh that we shouldn't historicize everything. We don't need to see everything as a prof in apocalyptic as a prophecy after the fact, because a lot of times we're dealing with typologies that existed earlier, and we can see traces of where that developed. So it's a mistake to always assume that these are straight up historic retellings in the mythic guys. So in this be, case, so yeah. would it be like um fair, like say in the book of Revelation to give like a Christian example to like yeah. the audience, like there's the dragon and there's the beast, but that's not necessarily like one to one corresponding to a certain future individual. It could be like say a corporate entity, or it could be a personification of the forces right. of evil. Maybe that's something what that's going exactly. on here. Exactly, exactly, because we do have moments where this Armillus is identified with likely Her Heraclitus and B the Byzantine emperors, especially who were fighting the Persians and pressing Jews at the time. But as it's been shown, the etymology is probably from Greek for the destroyer of nations. So we've got something that's a destroyer of nations and gets associated with Romulus, the founder of Rome, and Rome is associated with Christianity and Edom or Idumea. And that gets associated with Balaam in the book of Numbers. So we've got these, all these associations coming forth into one person who takes over a lot of the traditions of the Antichrist in early Christian apocalypses and the Jal, the horned one in Muslim apocalypses that drew from the same traditions. So this force, it has like, it has historic and antecedents there, but it's mostly a personification of, in this case, an entire religion and empire. And there's a lot of spots where this is a pretty strong this is a pretty strong anti-Christian parody because the Sarmilis is described in monstrous terms. He's giant, his issues going on with his eyes and feet sometimes, and he's the spawn of Satan and, this, and a beautiful stone statue of a woman, of a maiden woman, as it's called. So very strong anti-Christian polemic going on there. So, so it would be fair to say he was not the Messiah, but he was a very naughty boy. <laughs> yeah. uh, for, for those of you who are wondering, that's from the like uh, Life of Brian, which is the best movie of all time. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I just had to throw we're in we're one Life of Brian brother. reference. Yeah. I'm glad uh, you did. Yeah. So, um, this, so the Messiah son of Joseph in the, in the strongest early tradition that we have, is basically fighting against a personification of Rome and Christianity. So not too dissimilar to like say how many interpreters like Bach and think like the book of Revelation, uh, the dragon is actually a personification of Rome and so forth. It, it would not be yeah. too dissimilar to that it's idea. It's very similar to that. Yeah. These are different interpretations of the same basic idea that Rome and especially in later Judaism, Christianity associated with Rome, are the personification of evil. And later on in Kabbalah, that becomes more and more spiritualized also. Oh, that's interesting. So um, 
Any anything else you want to discuss about the more historical interpretations and beside Ben Joseph, or do you want to move on to maybe like the later spiritualization of the traditions? So just a little bit more about the historical ones. We have I mentioned earlier the slum through a wrench into the whole historical schema of redemption, because you're supposed to have the two different kingdoms that are fighting, and the third one comes up. So then they've got to figure out where in the Bible mentions this because they don't believe that you could have something without a way to trace it back. So they go into Isaiah with one of the verses about camels and writers on camels and chariots, and they see that as a slum. And then they've got, first they're very welcoming in it, then they see that they're being mistreated again, ambivalent. The Messiah and the Joseph traditions play into that. And he gets discussed fairly often. Well, I mean, fairly often. We still have a limited number of texts. But during the medieval era, we have when Kabbalah becomes a, more of a thing, there's a strong spiritualization of everything. Because basically in Kabbalah, everything is a symbol that corresponds with something else. So for example, when you have Noah's Ark, that's, some, that's a symbol, for example, the creation of the world or other things. And you have Noah and his three sons coming out and they all represent forces in the Godhood above. And one of the big ideas in the Kabbalah is that things have gone out of whack on earth. And what goes, what happens wrong on earth happens wrong in heaven. So we have a broken world. The exile of Israel is the exile of God's presence from the earth and from God himself. And they treat it in terms like a husband and wife separated. So a lot of the Kabbalistic rituals are about bringing God and his presence in Israel back together and reuniting them. And redemption becomes a matter of redeeming sparks of divine light that have sunk into everything in creation. And so it's sunk in these mud, in these husks. And in the early stages of Kabbalah, we still have, we actually find an interesting thing with Abu Lafia in the 13th century, who sees the Messiah, son of Joseph, as representing Christianity, and himself is the transmigrated soul of David. And that's his struggle with Christianity is bringing them, reuniting them and getting them to stop fighting against Israel. Uh, just uh, the whole transmigration, uh, for those maybe wondering, that would be like a form of reincarnation or maybe multiple mortal probations when in uh, fundamentalist Mormon context. Would that be a fair parallel of sorts? It is. It is, it is a fair parallel. Basically, there's a soul and the soul has different parts to it. it. It's made up of many different parts. And these can go, either the whole soul or parts of it can be reincarnated in different people, even in the same lifetime sometimes. So this becomes a major, major cornerstone of, of later Jewish mysticism. This idea that there's souls that have transmigrated, not only in the people, but in the trees and animals and stones and everything. So every act that you do, you're saying the right prayer, you have the right contemplative intention about God, you're helping redeem the soul from the filth it's in. And when you bring all the souls together, that's when redemption happens and the world is repaired and God and his people are in harmony again. In the 16th century, there's a pivotal figure named Rabbi Sekluria. And he moved, from, he moved from Egypt to Israel to the town where I was born. And he moved there because there was a community of Kabbalists and who were big on repentance and preparing the way for redemption. And he started to teach in dropping hints that he and several of his disciples were incarnations of Messiah, Moses and Messiah. And he's been called in like one monograph calls him the physician of the soul because his, his emphasis was on making sure that people can overcome the need to transmigrate 
and be redeemed and put back in their proper place. And there's one tradition that he had this secret about a teaching in the Zohar, the big book of the Kabbalah, about the two young rows of a deer, or the children of a deer, that was very, very, it's very, very cryptic and opaque, even for Kabbalistic teachings, which is saying quite a bit. And one of his disciples implored him to keep teaching him that, the meaning of it. And he told him, please don't make me tell you that. At the same time, he was telling people to pray that the Messiah, son of Joseph, would not have to die. Repent and pray for him that he does not have to die. But his disciple, Rabbi Chaim Vito, keeps pushing him till finally he tells him, we don't have a source that actually says what it is, because he kept a secret, but he tells him that, and then he dies in the plague shortly after. And they miss a big year of redemption they were supposed to bring. His disciples sees himself as the Messiah, son of Joseph. And several scholars have pointed out that, that's, that you find hints of that. They both saw themselves as the Messiah, son of Joseph. And the role there was to bring about the redemption of those sparks that were trapped. And if the Messiah, well, if, if Israel is righteous and prays for him, the Messiah does not have to die. So even the death of the Messiah becomes optional. There's very few traditions where it actually has any kind of atoning value. That's one thing we miss pretty strongly in all the traditions almost. Okay, and then later on, the Sabbatian heresy in Judaism, after their Messiah converted to Islam, there was a huge crisis among his believers. Several of them downgraded him to Messiah Son of Joseph. And in 18th century Italy, we have a very famous rabbi, Moshe Luzzato, who wrote one of the best-selling books in Judaism of all time, The Path of the Upright, which is basically simplified Kabbalistic teachings for a moral basis. This book is like one in probably the top 10 or five or 10 books, most widely read in Judaism ever. But he ran into a lot of trouble and was forbidden to teach Kabbalah by rabbis in Italy because he gathered a cycle of friends and disciples, he was Moses. One of his friends was Messiah son of David, one's a Messiah son of Joseph. And they went into several of the heretical teachings. But yeah, you had this whole circle of people, again, who were teaching that they, that some of them were the different messiahs. And maybe I should just like ask, um, was there any penalty or uh, at least on the books, even if there, it was never enacted for actually claiming to be either the Messiah been uh, son of David or the Messiah son of Joseph around this time. There was never a penalty, but in the years after the mid 17th century, the big issue was, are you a secret Sabbatian, a follower of Sabtai Tzvi or his followers? That's what, that's what they ran into trouble there because while they weren't Sabbatians in the sense they believed that Shabtai Tzvi was a messiah, Lutzato believed he was a messiah and Shabtai Tzvi was a failure, but they still borrowed a lot of their teachings and basically legitimized them. So you ran into issues like that. That's, that was the big split in Judaism for many, many years until you have modern forces like enlightenment, the European enlightenment and Judaism and things like that. But that was for about 200 years or so, that was the big heresy. Yeah. Um, no, that's no, that's interesting. Of course, like as you mentioned, uh, Sama Sai Zavi himself actually converted to Islam and that threw the wrench into his entire movement. <laughs> so uh, his movement held on for till the mid 19th century and yep. in Turkey until World War I. And then they basically just stopped functioning as a religious unit. You know? No, that's, uh, I, I've read a few articles and books on him and the movement, and that's really fascinating. So we might do something in the future about that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, fun there. 
yeah, it would be. Uh, especially because, like, uh, I know this is going off a bit topic, like, Alexander Campbell actually she made the parallel between Joseph Smith and Sebastian Sai Savi in Delusions. Mm-hmm. So it's been a parallel, even if it's not often made, it's sometimes made between right. him and Joseph. So, um, albeit like the Muhammad parallels, it's more like right. to, um, shock people. But, uh, yeah, no, that's no, that's that's all interesting. Uh, anything else you want to discuss, or do you want to move on to like maybe yeah, the then... um, attempts to spiritualize the um, traditions? Yeah, so that so the attempts to spiritualize it have to be seen in light of the fact that later Kabbalah and Yudha Libas emphasizes really strongly, Lawrence Fine in his book on Luria also pointed this out, that the main preoccupation of later Kabbalists is with themselves, their souls, and the souls of their friends, and not with the theoretical things like the contraction of light or the breaking of the the vessels contain divine light and things like that, which were a big focus in the early academic studies. The theoretical was not their main concern. Their main concern was purifying their souls and redeeming the sparks in the world. So you could end the transmigration and have the redemption happen that way. And they actually inverted the order because generally the Messiah, son of David, would come in and complete things. You didn't have to have the world perfect for him, but they believed you have to prepare it so redemption can happen naturally. So the Messiah, son of Joseph traditions figured very strongly into this. And they started adapting it to other characters. For example, Luxato teaches that the Messiah and Joseph is the soul of Cain. Cain and Abel were, Abel was the right side, which is the better, purer side in Kabbalistic metaphysics and cosmogony. So he was a physical representation of the right side. Abel was a physical representation of the left side, which is closer to the forces of evil. But they were supposed to work together and undo Adam's sin. We pray the world. But then Cain slew Abel. He was transmigrated later in Jeroboam. And Jeroboam should have been the Messiah who reunited the kingdoms, but he but he fell with the sin of the golden calves. Well, and, and, and as we know, like um Cain's soul was actually transmigrating, not the Jeroboam, but to um, um Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I lived in Logan. So many people claim to see not Bigfoot, but Cain. <laughs> yeah. But it would work with Jeroboam because, of course, like the golden yeah. calf incident in Exodus 32 and 33 right. and that, was like the greatest sin. And basically, since the, just had to beg God yeah. not to, like, uh, since Adam. So, yeah. Right. Because that's when they should have restored everything together. And then he's, then he's transmigrated in his Shabtai Tzvi. And he's transmigrated again. And yeah, so it keeps happening like that. So the Messiah has to, the Messiah of Joseph attracts the forces of evil who try to overwhelm him. And he oftentimes fails. And this is actually, to bring back to an earlier point, this is really important to note. Ephraim Urbach, one of the premier scholars of the 20th century in rabbinics, pointed out the Messiah son of Joseph fails at redemption. He never actually brings about the redemption. He tries and fails. Sison and Joseph has to come in and complete that. So in the Kabbalah, the later one, they're worried the people who saw themselves as a Messiah, son of Joseph, were worried about repairing their souls or the ones around them who they saw as that. So they wouldn't have to fail another test and can bring about the redemption. So that became the main focus. And about a decade ago, I, I wrote, I presented a paper at one of the Mormon scholars conferences where I looked at someone who was born same year as Joseph Smith. This was a Hasidic rabbi named Rabbi Isaac, Isaac Isaac of Komarna, which is in Western Ukraine. And he saw himself as a Messiah son of Joseph, and he was born a month after Joseph Smith. And he was convinced that he was a Messiah son of Joseph in part because the numerical value of the year he was born adds up to the value of Messiah son of Joseph. 
And so I go more into that in my paper a little bit on his self-conception of himself. But again, he saw his role as repairing the broken world to prepare it for the Messiah and the David. What, what I'll do is like I'll include a link to your academia.edu page where your paper on that is um, provided. But like for maybe for like some people who may not know like the different branches of Judaism and Jewish thought, uh, could you maybe like give like in a sentence or two uh, Hasidism and how that differs from like nor the normal Judaism one will encounter, if you will? So in the 18th century, you had a lot of mystics around who held to very complicated rituals for purification that are rooted like in the 16th century that I mentioned with Rabbi Sekluria that the normal person couldn't attain to. Lots of fasting, lots of praying all night. And this was a piet, the, the Hasidic movement was a pietist movement. You would attach yourself to a righteous man who knew how to repair your soul and to bring you closer to God, he served as a conduit. He brought down God's blessings down to the people below, brought the prayers of people up to God. And so people would attach themselves to one of these sadiqs, as they're called, the righteous men. And that's the Hasidic movement, and they, they took a lot of the devotion and simplified it. Rabbi Isaac that I mentioned was one of the more scholastic minded individuals in the movement. That's why he had a smaller following, but he was devoted to more of the theoretical Kabbalistic side. So the popular devotion. And the reason why I focused on that was he considered himself the Messiah son of Joseph. And one thing I forgot to mention that by Lusato's time, it's considered that the Messiah son of Joseph reveals divine secrets. You don't have any word of teaching of the Messiah son of Joseph prior to the late Middle Ages. That's not one of his role is restoring scripture or anything like that. Is there any discussion as to the contents of these secret teachings? There, there is. There is. Like, if we're talking Isaac Cluria, we have hints at it, which is mentioned quite a bit. And we can kind of reconstruct what was going on based on what we know of their life. With Lutzato, we have a lot of his teachings that were hidden. He wasn't allowed to publish them. But we know, for example, that everything he did, he saw in messianic terms. He saw himself as a transmigration of Moses. He married a girl named Sipporah, and he wrote his wedding contract, basically spelling out the redemption of Israel by his marriage. Rabbi Isaac of Komenor wrote a secret diary where he recorded his visions and dreams and everything. Which there's a good, there's a decent English translation of in a lot of my paper. Well, basically most of my paper draws from that. So it wasn't public, but it was kept by his children and followers. So um, would it be fair to say like it wasn't pertinent necessarily of the public preaching or teaching? It would be like, maybe like an, uh, it's not going to be a perfect analogy, but like an analogy would be like, say, Jesus, the meaning of the parables. He'd give out parables, he'd confuse some people, but only to the inner community, if you will, would he give the interpretation? Would it be similar to that kind of um, very, secret very teachings? Very, similar. Very, very similar. And in fact, with Luria, we know that he he was very upset when his disciples shared some of the secrets because other people came over and assisted them being taught and they and he didn't consider them ready for his teachings and then he couldn't teach his disciples what they needed to know okay so very much like that cool i just kind of brought that just maybe to help like uh, LDS yeah. reader uh, listeners to understand like uh, the dynamics going on uh, here but no that's perfect uh, anything else you want to say about the uh, more spiritualized uh, tra traditions and teachings about the MSI Ben Yosef? Just that around the year 1839-1840, there was, there was a big belief that this would be the year of redemption. And so a lot of people started moving to the land of Israel and preparing for that and trying to bring the Messiah about. And one of the books that comes out of that period, I mean, it, it's transmission history, is complicated and it's got a lot of later teachings at the start of the 20th century 
but some of it dates as far back as the 18th. And it, it really develops a very complex theory of the Messiah, of multiple Messiah, son of Joseph, and things that relate there. So you have this constant development until about the 20th century. And that goes away for a while until 1967 with the Six Day War. That book that only a few people knew about, they called The Voice of the Turtle Dove, gets published. And it's about the steps to redemption and the Messiah and the Joseph. So that enjoyed a brief resurgent, resurgence in the 60s and 70s. You can still find traces of that today in settler movement in Israel, places like that. No, oh, that's fascinating. Um... You want to move on to, like, say, um, the Messiah Ben Joseph and also Joseph Smith? Yeah, why don't we do that? Yeah, okay. So to go back to, like, what we were saying, like, uh, there's been some very intelligent LES scholars and apologists who have tried to argue that based on... Oops, sorry. I think your audio cut out. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah, bloody connection. But like, uh, there's been like some very good, often careful LDS scholars and apologists in the past who have argued uh, Joseph Smith is the fulfillment of the Messiah Ben Joseph. And of course, they draw parallels between, like, say, you know, uh, the military battles and the general restoring temple worship. You know, a lot of things that, at least on the superficial level, would seem, yeah, these these are good, interesting parallels in a Jewish tradition that may not be too familiar with. Joseph Smith, let alone Adam Clark or whoever you yeah. want. Um, right. You know, you know, you know. We mentioned Tretness. I think he did the best work on the topic, and hopefully, his book uh, will be posthumously published someday. Um, we can only hope. Yeah, uh, I have a friend who I'm badgering to try to get that done at the moment, as you know. But um, you know, there's also Matt Brown, who I got on well with, um, and a number of others as well. Joseph Hill McConkey, Cleon Scouse, and etc. Um, and also a um, most recently, Hannah Stoddard, um, although I don't have any respect for her as a person. Um, they've, they've made uh, some parallels between uh, the Messiah's son of Joseph and Joseph Smith. So as someone who actually is familiar with the sources yourself, you know, I think it's kind of fair to say, like, uh, uh, it's not as clear cut as like Trenton is no. and others. So no, my, I mean, my question to you is like, I don't want to be categorical about sure. it. Sure. I don't be categorical. I think you can make it work if you really wanted to by spending time in the sources. Sure. So, like, you know, as we're both believing Latter Day Saints, um, if I were to ask you, like, Alan, um, is there any way to actually meaningfully, in an exactly sound manner, to argue, even if you have the nuanced things, that Joseph Smith could be a candidate for the uh, fulfillment of the Messiah Ben Yosef? How would you go about it? Do you, do you think it could be salvaged yeah. in an exegetically sound manner? Do you think it would have to be nuanced? You know, um, how would you go about it? So you could do it. Why you would want to do it might be a different matter. I mean, I, I do also want to note again that none of this is meant to take away from Joseph's role as a prophet. But I have strong testimony that he's a prophet of restoration. He is authoritative and prophets down to today have the authority same line through him so it's by no means meant to say anything against joseph or that because this also wasn't any of his perception yeah it this should be a fair construct like, yeah. that modern scholars in the church have noticed and are trying to fit him into yeah it should be known like Joseph, whether or not he's the fulfillment of the Messiah Ben Yosef, that's not contingent upon he's been a prophet of God. Like the analogy I often use, and it's kind of got me into trouble, is like, where not the Book of Mormon is like inspired scriptures, not dependent upon it's whether it's the literal fulfillment of, say, Isaiah 29 or Ezekiel 37. Um, right. You know. Yeah, it's just that's the thing. We're not talking about Joseph not being a prophet or anything. It doesn't hinge on this at all. So, with that being said, if you want to see him as Messiah, son of Joseph, these are things that you need to do. And this is what I would do. First, you got to track down every text you can find. If you speak more than just English, all the better. Hebrew is a must if you're trying to get seriously into that. French can help. I don't have French, but a couple of this, the sources were published that way. German, of course. But essentially, Hebrew is the main language, Hebrew and Aramaic. You need those two. You need to look at the texts. You've got to take them and see what they're saying, 
and at what point. So if I were looking for Joseph Smith in this, I wouldn't go for a parallel like Joseph Smith was in the Nauvoo Legion. Therefore, he was a warrior messiah like this because he didn't do almost anything with the Nauvoo Legion. It was there. And you could say Book of Zerubbabel doesn't show him as an active military leader. Sure, but that's, that's your reading into the parallels more than you're reading out of them. Closer is Zion's camp, but that ended in failure for the intended purpose. They, they didn't actually fight in the enemies or vanquish him. They all said they marched back, and this happened long before Joseph's death. It's not even a close parallel like that. So you want to leave some of the specifics behind that way. He does, okay, so he builds a temple. That's something you can put in that, that can go in the pro box with the pros and the cons. That can go in the pro box, fit him into that role. Gathering of Israel, you can spiritualize it because I know some people claim that bringing everyone to the British Isles is a literal fulfillment. I'm not going to argue that one way or the other. Let's just say that we've got a strong spiritualized comp component of this. And of course, it being the British Isles, I just hope it's not literal. <laughs> the British. <laughs> of course. Although, the, uh, although those always seem to hinge on really bad linguistic parallels, like the Tuatha Dé Danann being children of Dan and I mean, that's a whole different kettle of fish. I won't get sidetracked. So you, you can... Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. I might actually uh, have an episode where um, I discuss maybe with someone who wants to, like, why British Israelitism is just stupid, because unfortunately, it sometimes makes a revival here and there. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Even that. So you, you want to look for stronger thematic parallels, like restoration of temples, gathering of Israel, preparing the way for the other messiah. Now, when you do that, you've got to acknowledge that your concepts of the messiahs are different than what they are in Judaism. So you can't just like see it as a straight up fulfillment of what is in Judaism because they're looking for something completely different. For example, it, all the stories of Messiah and Joseph are centered around the physical city of Jerusalem. If we're looking at it that way, Orson Hyde has as much a claim to be the Messiah son of Joseph as Joseph Smith does. And he appear, he sets out in 1838-1839, when they're in the height of the messianic fervor, waiting for the land to be redeemed. And he heads there and he consecrates the land for the gathering of Israel and all that. And if you look at the later concepts like the voice of the turtle dove, you can make a stronger case for him in many cases. But you have to be looking at late Judaism for that, not, not the earlier stuff. Anyway, so you can look at thematic parallels. That's probably going to be your strongest thing is saying there's a forerunner who prepares the way for the Messiah by, by gathering Israel, restoring temples. That's how I'd go about it. Now, you can pick various details if you know the sources. And you can sometimes see things that are hinted at if you know the sources. What's not being said is often as loud as what is being said. I think like maybe like the possible LDS uh, counter, like say some of the um, nuancing one would have to do, you know, as opposed to the whole, um, it's it's rather explicit, would be, well, you know, there's been a corruption of the sources. Um, you know, is there any evidence that you know, outside like say maybe some textual variants here and there that there's been a widespread corruption of the uh, various texts and traditions about the messiah and joseph not at all not at all we see different strands developing at different times so we know there are a lot of traditions that coalesced in the byzantine era like i mentioned earlier but many of the elements that we want to point out to you we draw a lot from the book of Zerubbabel when we compare it to Joseph Smith. You, you have to lose that if you're seeing it as a corruption. Yeah, so like one possible out, if you will, you know, um, 
would be, you know, you know, just as with the Bible, it's true as far as it's translated correctly and like one's mileage on what that means will vary, you know, right. th- to transpose that to the manuscripts is like you could claim it, but you know, um, there's no meaningful evidence for this. Like the textual tradition is pretty stable, you know, even with the divergence uh, traditions. It's reading it back into the Bible and in the Judaism between between the destructions of the temple that's when you have to get very very creative and see it read into it there it doesn't flow from that and when you look at how they're actually using it it doesn't speak to corruption on that no that's fine i just kind of see like maybe some well-meaning yeah. but errant lds say well you know maybe there's been a corruption so of course it's not going to be easy as... go to yeah it's, yeah. An, it's an easy go-to that's why you also need to know the sources and i'm happy to take this up go through sources with anyone kind of starter if she wants to anyone else who is genuinely interested in looking at this as a tradition as as a living whole tradition i'm happy to do that you know and if hannah stoddard listen ever listens to this and wants to take you up you know i'll happily host it so uh yeah, yeah. Not not as a debate or anything hostile, but I'm happy to go through what we can actually learn from the text. So here, here's how I would see it. If I wanted to treat this as a thematic parallel, not a fulfillment so much, we just say in Judaism, they, they don't view the Messiah as just one thing. They've got different roles for him. Part of these roles are very similar to roles that Joseph might be playing in the latter days. And we've got enough in Judaism of not corruption, but of spiritualizing that you could justify some of those parallels a little bit better. Because if the Messiah, son of Joseph, is not having to fight flesh and blood enemies, then you, then the issue of Joseph Smith not being a war leader, as per se, isn't a big one there. That that's the that's the long and short of how I go about it. Just view it as thematic parallel. Would it be any other thing that maybe a latter day saint could meet on an exegetically sound level? Maybe hold to like maybe the year of his birth or some other thing that's been pointed to. Year of his birth, you could argue that that's significant. You certainly could, because he was born in the year associated with messianic hope and preparing for the year of the turtle dove in 1839-1840. He's burning the year with the numerical value of the size of St. Joseph. So you could write that off as a coincidence, or you could say, well, maybe he's here to fill that role. Now, with a caveat here, if you're going to do that, you've got to think long and hard about how much value you're going to place on numerological calculations and what they may or may not tell you also. So that it comes with kind of that hidden cost that you need to consider. And I would also throw in one other hidden cost would be like, it does smack up determinism. Um, it does too. And of course that would be incompatible with like a, the Latter-day Saint understanding, let's say libertarian freedom. You know, I often joke um, that, um, you know, uh, most Latter-day Saints are functionally uh, hardcore Calvinists when it comes to determinism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's pretty true of American Christianity in general. Yeah. It's, it seems All, to apologies to Tarek the core if he listens to this. Yeah. <laughs> no no hard feeling, Tarek, it was ordained thus. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, it's it's something we've got, we've got to just look long and hard about what the costs are with this that we're willing to take. <laughs> we can you can view it as a spiritualized fulfillment in many ways you think like a possible apologetic uh would be maybe to show like say the new testament use of old testament uh prophecy do you think there could be like some kind of um additional accommodation for that like you know hosea 11 1 you know out of Egypt we call my son of course in its original context it's about physical israel being called out from the exodus uh, there's the idea of census planor, the fuller sense yeah. being brought out in Matthew, where it's the holy family after the death of Herod. Do you think there could be any like um, nuancing when it comes to that, like say a parallel to like the New Testament use of the Old Testament and also the concept of census planor, some other ideas as well? Or do you think that may be like a, um, uh, an errant uh, approach to take? 
it's more justified than the straight up historicized reading that we have of it. That would be more justified as saying he's fitting that mold. You could do that. Before you do that, I would want you to at least argue why we should be adopting that model. And you can't just say because it's in the scripture and the corruption. You've, you've got to look at the evidence in its totality. But if you can argue for why you should do, then yes, I think you can definitely argue that this may be like other fulfillments of the scripture. No, no that's, that's fine. I do see that like uh, maybe yeah. a better approach to take than some of the other approaches, you know, but even then it would have seemed like, say, there's a multivalency to the original texts and maybe put it on the same level as like God reads scripture and stuff like that. But you could. You know, yeah. I, it wouldn't be my preferred method, but you, Same you could you could justify it. That's the thing. I wouldn't if if a member of the church in good faith is off is arguing for that after they've considered the evidence in totality, it's justified. Oh, that's fine. But like um, even like say stepping outside, like say Joseph Smith, uh, do you think that there's a value to like Latter-day Saints studying, even just for intellectual reasons, like the Messiah Ben Joseph? And what do you think like the good stuff? Again, presenting for like Joseph Smith as the fulfillment purportedly that Larry Day Saints could get by studying this certain strand of messianic thought. I think there's huge value in that. It's basically, if you want to understand your own tradition, it really helps to look at how other people are approaching similar things. You can notice a lot in there that's really interesting and helpful. It definitely should. The more you understand about topics that can relate to the church the better prepared you are intellectually as a disciple so i think there's huge value one of the reasons why i wrote that paper on rabbi isaac was to compare him with joseph smith just to bring up some interesting parallels and differences between two people who had a very prophetic role for themselves in what they were teaching and they come from different traditions, which the differences are just as valuable. So I think the more people can learn about this, the better, just for its own sake. Yeah, and like what comes to mind is like what the Lord said about the Apocrypha, the Deuterocanonical books in section 91. You know, I think that can be transposed to any religious literature or taught. You know, um, you know if you're informed and you're guided by the Spirit, you can actually sift the wheat from the chaff. It's probably the same here when it comes right. to like various uh, messianic traditions. Remember that book a few years ago by the Maronite Lebanese philosopher about the three Nephites? Yeah. That, yeah. You remember that book where he was taking this Lebanese Christian, took the idea of three Nephites, compared it to Buddhist thought. And it could have been a really, really intellectually stimulating book i'm not going to lie to you it was perhaps the most boring book in mormon studies it was ever published terrible yeah. it was yeah it really came out terrible the, the writing is really dense and opaque the worst french philosophical tradition you can imagine but just the the writing aside the parallels that he's putting through he's trying to read the three nephites as a buddhist thing and he's just it doesn't come out clear in either tradition. That's shoehorning it into it, which we do all too often as LDS because we want sure. to see it there. So what I'm suggesting is if we want to make it work, we've got to become familiar back and forward with the primary text and also pick up good secondary sources like Reeves, like Hemofarb. There's a few others in Hebrew I'd mention, and Neumann has some English stuff, but it's just we, we've got to get more familiar with it as a tradition on its own terms before we try to fit our own prophetic traditions into it. I agree. So, um, yeah, this has really been enlightening. Do you have anything else you want to share on this? or um... Not at the moment. I'm happy to do follow-ups if people have questions or if they want to contact me directly. Yeah, in fact, like uh, maybe like if some were, were hopefully they'll listen to it and they might have questions like they want to like hit you up with maybe clarifications or maybe other book recommendations. Um, what is the best way to actually contact you? You can reach me on Facebook. You can reach me on my email and I'll send that here right now. I should. 
we might have that. But I'm happy. I'm happy to reach out that way. If you want a phone call, we can arrange that. But yeah, I, either method really does work. So let me send that to you again, so you could put that in there. Anyone who would like to go through even just a close reading of the text, because I had to simplify down a lot of things. There's a lot of connections to other texts and sometimes Bible verses and things that we've had to leave out. Well, that's nature at base, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll include um, your details anyway on the show notes. But um, yeah, it's it's it was a really fun discussion. Hopefully, like Latter Day Saints will uh, pursue some of the sources that were referenced and will actually delve a bit more. And you know, even if one wants to still make a case like Joseph Smith's the fulfillment, it's like you'll be I, more informed. You'll be in a better place to do that. Yeah, and you know, I wish you all whoever does it. You know, I wish you all the best. You know, um, but right. yeah. So. Um, well, uh, thanks again, Alan, for your time. I'm really thanks, Robert. It. Yeah, I appreciate um, and that hopefully well. we'll have you on again to discuss some other topic in the near future. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah thank so you. again, um, thanks. I to know this can get very nerdy, but thanks for you all for bearing with us. What do you mean, but? <laughs> <laughs> true, but yeah, yeah, that's true. But um, yeah, hopefully we can actually have you on. Um, I do plan on like maybe around Easter doing a uh, live stream and discussion of the life of Brian. Fantastic. Um, so I'll hopefully be we can actually that. have you and maybe a few <laughs> others on for that. But until then, uh, thanks for your time. And um, Absolutely. You know, uh, hopefully this will be educational to those who will listen to it. So uh, thank you again. Thank you.